Hello and welcome back to the MBA Cohort Videocast. My name is Alex Miller and today I'm with Professor Moritz talking about simulation learning. What is it, how he uses it, and where he sees it going in the future. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and visit our website, thembacohort.com. Thank you and enjoy. Okay, so Professor Moritz, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're here to talk about simulation learning. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with simulation learning, uh, would you mind giving us a little background on, on what it is from a high-level perspective? Sure. Simulations provide a safe place for learners to take risks and make mistakes while replicating real-world challenges. Um, for example, there's a team-building simulation called Everest, uh, whereby teams set goals to decide how to, count, how to conquer Mount Everest. And the goal is to be sure no one dies on their quest, although many people do, while building leadership, teamwork, and developing personal risk-reward models. Um, the theory is that, you know, in simulation, students will come away with better theoretical understanding of what is going on in terms of business, and especially when integrated with other materials like case studies, research papers, projects, quizzes, and tests. Um, feedback from learners and professors, by the way, indicates that it encourages action-based um, learning in classroom, re in MBA classrooms in particular, creates high engagement with the learning environment and also increases a great deal of retention of the concepts that are being taught. Um, students also learn that they need to collaborate, compete, and weigh emotional versus rational choices, which are critical in business today. So it's a team building concept. It's understanding how to collaborate, how to compete, or as well as to collaborate, and also not only that, but to take a look at rational choices and emotional choices from a bit of a stand back situation so that when you're thrown into business, then you can make better, better decisions as a result. Um, and by the way, this all feeds into other research that suggests that students retain lessons better when they work in environments that allow them to apply lessons uh, that are simulated uh, for real world issues. Right, so it sounds like some of the advantages are that students retain the information better because they will visualize to a, a real world scenario going through a business case. Uh, yes. From your classes or from other research, have you found any disadvantages or uh, critiques of simulation learning? Well, you know, one, you know, I guess one critique is that a simulation cannot be the only thing that you do in a classroom. It doesn't work by itself. You have to be sure that as a, whether you are the learner or the professor, that it integrates with other things going on. So for example, it becomes one of the many tools that a professor can use to help people understand things better and the concepts and learn them. So oftentimes I combine uh, simulations with case studies um, that help reinforce the similar concept. I also have frequently gone into, and in a marketing principles course, for example, we get into things like the four P's and Porter's five forces and conceptual maps. While it's not built into the simulations, what I do is I ask students as they finish up, you know, two or three rounds of the simulation, I will say to them now, within this simulation, what I'd like you to do is the results you got for the first three rounds, please analyze it within regards to Porter's five forces. And maybe the next few rounds, I'll say, let's use the four Ps. What are the things that you discovered as a result in using that framework? And finally, um, one of the things we do uh, in my marketing principles courses and even my data analytics course is that we get into customer lifetime value. So I ask students, now you've got all this data, build a customer lifetime value model and project sales or project the amount of media that you're actually going to have to spend. So working by itself, it's not you know, the ultimate thing, it's a good thing, but when you work with other things, um, that is probably the best way to use it. Right, and it sounds like it's kind of an innovative, cutting edge way of relaying information to students. Uh, so my question to you is, in what setting did you start to teach like this? Was it in an MBA setting, an undergrad setting? Was it uh, online or, or in classroom? Uh, in what setting did you start teaching simulation learning? Sure. I actually started teaching it, um, I was, I guess, about five or six years ago. I was teaching an MA, MBA class in marketing principles that was um, a hybrid course. It met, every, um, it met online every week. Um, it was asynchronous, and then three times during the semester, I came to campus. Um, I was introduced by the previous professor into simulations, um, and, it was a, and I got hooked on it at that particular point. So I had to learn how to right away take a simulation, execute it in an online classroom situation, and then later on, later in years, when I had classrooms in person, that's when I started doing it in person. 
But online, it worked really well. Um, what happened was, is that what I learned from that first experience, that had been set up to teach, to, to use the pedagogy of simulations late in the course. So in, this, in the last quarter of the course, as a way to reinforce concepts. What I discovered was, <clears throat> is that I pushed it to the first two or three weeks to start the simulation in the course as a way to get students really into things like numbers so that they understood that the implication of marketing principles is all based on you know dollars. And it's based on other kinds of things as well. So I pushed it up there and then what I did is that I realized that's when I brought in the marketing concepts as a reinforcement of what was going on. The result is, by doing it earlier rather than later, at least in my courses, is that it informs the students and they do a better job on, in two areas. One is that they do a much better final project, which is a, usually about 15 or 25% of their grade, depending on the school that I teach in. So they understand what I am looking for in the final project, because I structure the final project and the simulation not to be similar, but one informs the other. It, it's good practice. The other thing, and, I, and by the way, I have done polling with students to find out what do you think? Mm -hmm. And the students have found consistently, and I've only started doing the polling over the last year, I have to get more into the details of the polling, but the students have said that it increases their understanding of the concept, so it's a good reinforcement. And the second thing that it does is that it builds teamwork. In other words, I get many students who, you know, I've got a variety of students. Some students are coming back to school after, you know, five or 10 years in the work environment. Some are coming right out of undergraduate. But for the most part, it teaches them how to collaborate better. Um, so in that regards, um, it, it's an excellent thing to do. Right. Uh, you talked about earlier uh, the numbers being incorporated into a marketing class. Uh, for simulation learning, are there certain courses or subjects that simulation works better in? Uh, for example, a managing organizations class versus a statistic class or is there a way to incorporate simulation learning in any subject or course? Well, at this point, I, I mean, I, I would say it works almost anywhere. So mm -hmm. I, I teach classes in leadership. Um, I use the Everest simulation we talked about before where the idea is that no one should die on the conquest of Everest. And there's different goals of that. And inevitably what happens is people make decisions where people in the team do die. And you've got to go back and figure out how to resurrect them. There is other, there are negotiation simulations that teach people how to, and this, the negotiation simulation is fascinating in that you have to do it all by computer, whether it's in class or online. And this teaches you a real world situation of what goes on today as we are in COVID. You know, we are negotiating online many times. So you have to learn how to do that. Um, in my data management and modeling course, um, I use a data simulation for people to teach them how to use lots of different kinds of information, which, you know, if you use a piece of information, uh, let's say based on inventory and another piece of information based on marketing demographics and another one based on manufacturing and then finally another one based on my marketing costs, you find out that you get thousands of permutations and results. You learn the P&Ls. Um, so, um, I, so I've used them in leadership, marketing principles, data management. I use them in a behavior management course and teaching people how consumers behave differently. So there's always a, you know, a person who does something, you react to stimuli, and how do we put that then into a behavioral concept that deals with Dictor or with Freud, for example. I also use it in a capstone course. Um, the capstone courses I teach um, are the final course given to students in usually either MBA programs or in marketing in, or integrated marketing master's programs and they have to develop a business. And I usually start off with um, something called food truck. And the great thing about this is that it, it takes about 90 minutes to run in class and it gets people thinking about, you know, where should I put my food truck? What should I sell on, mm -hmm. on my food truck? And it puts them in the entrepreneurial mindset for the rest of the course. So it's almost anything that you'd like to do. Um, and the great thing is, is that, you know, uh, a place like Harvard B Publishing, which does a lot of simulations, if you give them your, as a professor, your syllabus, they will then hand your syllabus to a professor who's on, you know, contract with Harvard to evaluate which simulations are likely to be good for your course. So I have yet to see a course where there's not a match. Yeah, and it probably speaks to the real world application that simulation learning adheres to. Um, 
And you talked about you, you took polls from students to try to get their feedback on, on how they were retaining the information. Uh, I love the food truck idea and the entrepreneurial mindset. Are there any uh, anecdotal data that you have from students on, on how they've applied this either in their real life or just what they took away from the course or any well, anecdotes from students? Well, actually, it's interesting you say that. There turns out there's one graduate this semester from NYU who posted something on LinkedIn saying that, you know, one of the things about the simulation that worked really well for her was that she was actually able to apply some of the concepts directly into a marketing internship that she had. Mm -hmm. Another student wrote me an email a few years ago saying that what she learned from the simulation, which then informed her projects, enabled her in her first marketing job to actually apply things and understand the consequences of her decision, to, you know, whether she spent money, who she was targeting, what product or form of the product that she was targeting against, you know, particular target market. So, yes, I get a lot of good feedback from the students about it. Yeah, as a current student, uh, we've done simulations in classes, and, and I'm a huge fan of it as well. You, you just, it's a different way to learn. You put yourself in the scenario. Uh, so I'm all for it, favor for it. But let's talk about from the faculty side. Uh, what does it look like for a professor to switch their class format or incorporate this format into whatever they may be teaching? So it, it, <clears throat> what's happened is, is that faculty have incorporated, first of all, it's easy to incorporate. We're not, you know, it, it should never be the only thing that is done within a class. Um, many of the simulations can run for eight, 10, 15 rounds, but the point is to make the students do that you know, maybe the first class inside class and then do it outside of class and provide you with a report. And then you do a debriefing. The great thing about incorporating this is that almost all the companies provide you with the simulations will provide the professor with great videos, you know, telling you what to teach, how to teach it, when to teach it, and how to incorporate in your classroom. It's not only videos that they show you, but there are also, in the case of you know, Harvard and the case of marketplace simulations, there are teaching notes. Sometimes the teaching notes are far more extensive than the simulation is, but it gives you a play-by-play -play book of how you should actually execute it. And a lot of times the executions are suggested. You can improve upon it if you'd like and adjust it and make it work. Um, and the great thing is, is that there's also videos on how to debrief the classroom. What are the things that you should be looking for? Um, what's very interesting is Harvard this past spring, as we went online, one of the things they did was that, well, how do you run an online debrief when you've got 100 students in a lecture hall? And the, one of the great things, and it was really a small thing, but it changed the way I looked at it. And I, by the way, I don't teach classes of 100. I usually teach classes of 20 to 35, but it still applies. And what the professor who wrote the simulation suggested and what she had seen successful was go out and do breakout rooms within Zoom of about five to six people and have them do a self debrief. And for a half hour, the professor should wander around those rooms talking about what the students are finding and provide them with a specific question to answer. Once you've done this for 30 minutes, bring everybody back to do a report and make sure people are on the other end responding to the report of what they think about. So creating interactivity that continues throughout the classroom, even if you're online. Which like you spoke about earlier is so important uh, to have a real world application of how to manage people online, how to relay information online, how to have group meetings online, because we're all in that remote environment. Uh, so l let me finish with a crystal ball question. Uh, what does it look like going forward uh, for higher education, uh, real world application of group meetings? Um, how much is uh, the virtual uh, teaching virtual soft skills going to come into play for higher education going forward? Well, I think teaching soft skills online, I assume that's what we're talking about. Right. So, you know, I think that this is going to be a critical issue. I mean, as I know, many of my schools at this point for the fall have not only said, you know, who can teach online, but if you're coming into the classroom, what are the accommodations we can make for you? So, and also for the students, because it's critical for the students to be social distancing as well as in the classroom. Um, how do we do that? So one of the things that the simulation that actually provides a professor with is the ability to tie concepts together and do it on a remote basis. So it keeps people engaged and learning all the time. Um, and I think that's probably the most critical thing. Um, the only, you know, the, 
and I would say to you this, that it, from a professor's standpoint, um, <clears throat> one of the great things I did was I attended simulation training for Harvard up in Boston for two days, and then also down uh, for marketplace simulations, I also attended it down in Knoxville, Tennessee. There, the great things about the training are not so much for what they are being taught, but your interaction with other professors. Harvard provides a much more international experience. People from all over the world fly in for these two days and fly in from California, while the marketplace simulations people get people from the Midwest, you know, mm -hmm. usually Iowa, Arkansas, um, Tennessee, of course, Kentucky, people you don't usually meet. And everybody has a slightly different point of view of how to teach all of these kinds of things. So that's what's really important. I think long term, as we, as we move on outside of COVID, people should try to get together and try to understand, but at least do it by Zoom and meet, meet different kinds of people to learn about different teaching styles. Yeah, it's not going anywhere, uh, this virtual remote environment, uh, one way or another. Hopefully not as, we're not going to rely on it as much, but no, that's really, that's really good insight. Uh, so thank you, Professor Moritz, for, for sharing your ideas, for sharing some thoughts with us. Uh, sure. It was an absolute pleasure having you, and, and we hope we can get back in the classroom soon enough, safely social distancing. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I appreciate it.